So for the next few minutes, we'll be talking specifically about the botulinum toxins. So in 2003, in the New York Times, it was written, it's probably premature to declare Botox the penicillin of the 21st century, but the deadly poison turned wrinkle remover is being put to some startling new uses. So again, we've kind of, the timeline beginning in the 1800s, identifying the, the toxin, um, Dr. Scott's work, FDA approval in 1989, and subsequent approval of, of other toxins, and lots and lots of indications for, for, the, for the toxins. <clears throat> so we said before that Clostridia botulinum is the bacteria that makes botulinum toxin. Um, it is an amazingly potent and lethal substance. It's said to be 100,000 to 3 million times more potent than this, the sarin nerve gas. The amount that you actually get, you know, we call it in units, but it's, it, it can be measured almost, you know, in thousands of molecules instead of trillions of molecules because, they're, because it's so strong. The way each, each uh, toxin, the ones that are available, they measure their potency in different ways. And, and I know, I can tell you that for Botox, it's measured basically based on how much it takes to kill half of a batch of rats. It's, it is a, it is a uh, biologic assay. And that's how they determine how strong it is when they make a batch. It inhibits the release of a certain substance called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. When your brain says to your hand, I want to move my finger, the impulses go in, down the spinal cord, into a peripheral nerve, and into the exact muscle you want to move. And in order to do that, it spits a substance from the nerve into the synapse. It binds to the muscle and causes the muscle to con contract. And that substance is called acetylcholine. There are seven different toxins that, that the Clostridia botulinum bacteria makes. A and B are the only ones that are commercially available. I think some of the other toxins have been looked at, and I can't give you much in the way of details, um, but none of those are, at least right now, being looked at for medical purposes. So, so a bit of a complex diagram, but let me try to run through it for you. So normally what happens is you have this is a nerve. This is what's called a nerve terminal. Down here is the muscle cell. In between is an area called the synaptic cleft. That's where they're very close to each other, but they don't touch. Normally what happens is when there's an impulse comes down the nerve, it causes this bag of acetylcholine to attach to this wall. These are called the synaptic vesicles. They're little bags full of neurotransmitter. And in order for it to attach to this wall and spit out its contents, it has to grab. The proteins have to join hands. And there's three proteins, and they're called snare proteins. There's synaptobrevin, SNAP25, and syntaxin. And each toxin affects a different one of those. But they all do the same thing. They all prevent that, those snare proteins from snaring. They can't hold on to each other. So normally, they, they grab each other. This fuses with the membrane and spits out acetylcholine that binds to the muscle. So what happens with Botox? We inject Botox. It's taken up. In, into the, uh, the blood vessel, or it's taken up into the muscle where it is formed into, with the membrane and, and goes into the nerve terminal. Here's our nerve terminal again. So it gets into the synapse, gets into the nerve terminal, and gets inside. Once it gets inside of the nerve terminal, there's two different chains. There's a light and a heavy chain. They break apart. The light chain 
comes out and comes down here and cleaves. It cuts like a scissors. It cuts these proteins. And different types cut different proteins in different places. The type A, so it cuts that protein so that snare protein no longer is effective and the synaptic vesicle can no longer fuse. So it paralyzes the muscle. And this single molecule kind of moves along and can, and can literally um, cut hundreds or thousands of these snare proteins. That's why it's so potent. So you get cleavage of the snare protein. The vesicles can't fuse. Over a little period of time, that nerve terminal actually deteriorates because it's not working. And it takes about 12 weeks for that terminal to regrow and new snare proteins to be created. And that's why you get a certain period of time that this drug lasts. On average, 12 weeks. For some people, it's less. For some people, it's a lot more. I have some people who can go out in four, even five months before their spasms start to get worse again. To date, we don't know of any long-term side effects. We were talking about this at lunch, the idea, well, this stuff gets in your brain, and how do we know this? This drug's been out for almost 30 years. Actually, yeah, well, it's been not approved for 30 years, but been used for 30 years. And for a lot of conditions, used in a lot higher doses than we use for blood for spasm. And we know of no long-term side effect issues. This is, a, this is a, from an article written by a medical journalist. Actually, it's a poison that can heal. It's on the FDA website. And this shows, this is with oculinum. This is kind of one of the first patients uh, um, had pictures of how s severe squeezing, so open the eyes manually, and then after, oculinum. Famous picture from, from Dr. Jankovic. So where do we treat with botulinum toxin? Well, I can't tell you that there's a standard paradigm. I think there's a paradigm that many neuro-ophthalmologists are most comfortable with, that different doctors do different things. I think that there are potential problems depending on where you treat and how much you treat in different places. So typically, I think this is a pretty standard pattern. We treat the upper lid on the outside, the upper lid on the inside, the lower lid on the outside, one kind of in the middle down here, and one out to the side here. What we don't do usually is treat the lower medial, the lower inner lid. How come? Because for a lot of people, when you treat that, the lid will fall down and won't no longer contact the, the, the globe and you get what's called ectropion. When that happens, the eye gets horribly irritated. So kind of stay away from there. Um, and these are just some pictures of other paradigms. A lot of them are older ones. This is actually kind of a classic. Um, so in this case, they are treating down in, inner, lower. As I say, I don't do that. And this is somebody else who uses a little higher dose. So in this, in this uh, case, the, they also are treating the proceris and the corrugators. A lot of people will also treat right, un, right next to the eyebrow, where you get a little bit of the frontalis in the upper part of the, of the uh, orbicularis oculi. So there's different patterns. I think every doctor has their own preferred pattern. Some may be better than others for any, any individual patient. So the onset of action, you guys know all this. I mean, onset of action, usually two to four days, you start to notice a change. You know, when I do a lot of injections for chronic migraine, and I tell patients, what you're going to notice in a few days is you can't wrinkle your brow. You can't, uh, um, you can look up, but your brow won't move with you. And it's funny because some people are big brow knitters. My wife is one. She just, and up until about 10 years ago, she had these deep furrows. She doesn't have those anymore. 
my daughter is 20 is getting them already, and I can't do it if I want to. I don't have any wrinkles because I can't furrow my brow, and that's natural. Um, but people that are big brow furrowers, they sometimes find, have difficulty when they can't move their brow. They don't like it. Um, but I tell people in a few days you'll notice you can't move your brow. That's, and it's typically two or three days. Um, in the original studies on, on Botox, there really were only some dozens of patients. It wasn't a big study. And 93% of people were, have said they had significant response. As so we talked about before, for the most part, everybody responds. How good that response is depends on a lot of factors, how well they were treated, where they were treated. But everybody gets weakening of muscle. Um, what are those common side effects? So we are talking before about ptosis or droopy eyelid. I think it's fairly common. It's more common in new injectors. When studies on headache were done initially, almost a quarter of people got, got droopy eyelids because you had new people injecting, weren't quite sure where they were supposed to go. I n essentially never get ptosis when I inject for migraine. So it's kind of knowing where, where you are. On the other hand, I have some people that no matter what I do, they get some eyelid drooping. So what I do in that case is I don't treat the upper inner lid, and that often will help. <clears throat> Double vision is pretty rare. Um, there's other problems. We talked about ectropion. And most of the side effects, the ptosis that people get can usually resolves in a few weeks. There are eye drops that may enhance the sympathetic activity of the lid to help it be a little more open. Bruising, bruising occurs. As Dr. Savino told you, I mean, as big as Bruce was his wife, that kind of is what always happens to us. If you're a doctor or a doctor's wife or a nurse, you have all the complications. It's just, it's just the law. Um, but yeah, I, and, and especially when I'm injecting uh, older patients that have very thin skin, put the needle in, take it out, and boom, there it is. You can just see it starting up. I go, uh-oh, you're going to have a bruise. Um, and as far as we know, no systemic or immunologic side effects. Eight to, eight to 16 weeks. I think most people are about 10 to 12. You know, that's been my experience. Some more, some a little less. So we've talked about double vision. We've talked about drooping and dryness. So often, especially when you're first treated, the eye may not close normally, and it, the eyelid is weak. At night, the eye may not be fully closed, so people often have to use drops, sometimes even taping at night. So how do we reduce the side effects? Well, by reducing the dosing. Some people can respond to as low as one and a quarter units in each spot. I tend to use two and a half units when I first start off at most spots, a little more laterally, I use five. Um, I know I saw a question here, you know, what's the average dose? So my new blepharospasm patients um, get about 25 to 30 units. That's how I usually start them. We avoid, um, uh, we avoid the upper inner, I'm sorry, the upper, avoid upper inner, lower inner. Oh, avoid upper inner to, uh, uh, to reduce ptosis. And sometimes when people are having side effect issues, changing toxins may be helpful. So in 2009, Botox, I shouldn't say Botox, all the botulinum toxins that were out, and back then there were three that were out, got what's called a black box warning from the FDA. The FDA issued a kind of a safety alert. And that black box warning was about distant spread of toxin. And what it says is post-marketing reports show that toxins may spread from the injection site and become systemic, and people can get asthenia, which just means feeling tired, generalized muscle weakness, double vision, difficulty uh, swallowing, difficulty with speech, um, difficulty with bladder, breathing difficulties. Symptoms have been reported hours to weeks after injection. Swallowing, breathing difficulties can be life-threatening, and there have been reports of death. The risk of symptoms is greatest in children treated with spasticity, um, but symptoms can occur in adults also treated with spasticity and other conditions. So the bottom line is, if you give enough Botox, 
you can cause enough to get out into the system, you can cause problems. Lucky for you, the amounts we use for blepharospasm are quite low. When we're treating cervical dystonia, we may use 300 to 400 units. The deaths were pretty much all children with cerebral palsy who were being treated with six, seven, eight, nine hundred units. And they were kids that were 50 and 60 pounds. And, you know, for years they were using high doses, but there were rare reports and they all got put together and the FDA says, whoa, we've got to be a little careful with this. But again, with the dosing that's being used for blepharospasm, there's not going to be that kind of issue or problem. So we now have four toxins on the market. So also what happened in 2009 is the FDA gave each toxin a new generic name because there were three botulinum toxin A's and one B. So Botox became onobotulinum toxin A, Xeomin became incobotulinum toxin A, Dysport a abobotulinum toxin A, and myoblock remabotulinum toxin A, or B. Now, who came up with those names? I have no idea. There's two that are approved by the FDA for blepharospasm. Does that mean the other two don't work? Toxins all work. But two companies did the work, did the clinical studies to show that they were effective. Allergan got by easy because back in the, in, in the 80s, the requirements for clinical trials were a lot easier than they are today. Um, MERS, who makes Xeomin, had to do much larger trial, much more statistically rigorous to show that they were effective. So Botox became available in 89. Um, Myoblock became available in 2000. And when it came out, we were using it for some people that seemed resistant to, uh, to Botox or not responding well. Uh, Dysport in 2009 and Xeomin in 2010. So I said before that if it's a toxin, it's going to cause weakness. It's true. Well, it's true. But they work in different ways, and they're not completely interchangeable. They all have their own side effect profile. They have their own units that don't correlate one to one. And if, for example, with this port, with cervical dystonia, the, the amount used is five times what we use for Botox. With other conditions, it may not be. It may be three, three, three times more instead of five times more, or eight times more. So it's not a one-to-one -one kind of conversion. So this is just a kind of a, a brief summary of some of the studies that have been done. Uh, there was a study um, uh, looking, I have to look up, yeah. Dysport, I forget the, the generic names. Uh, Dysport versus Botox, there was a study that looked at both of those um, one, head to head, and they, it was a small study for blepharospasm and hemifacial spasm, 91 patients, and what they found was that um, for the most part, they were, they were very similar. Uh, more patients needed what we call a booster, what we call a touch-up shot that was allowed in the, uh, in the Dysport group than in, uh, in the Onobotulinum group. Um, and the uh, Dysport might have lasted a little longer. Anybody here had Dysport? So I have to say that I've never used it. You know, I kind of grew up on Botox. It's what I use mostly for all of the conditions I treat. I know it. I, I'm comfortable with it. So it's not a drug I have a lot of, of I shouldn't say, I, I have knowledge of it, but I don't have personal knowledge of it. Um, there was another study looking at Xeomin versus uh, uh, um, uh, Botox, a double-blinded trial, and showed again that they were similar, pretty much equal to each other. And that study was done one-to-one, uh, -one, so the same dosing. And for Xeomin, for the most part, the dosing is, is pretty much identical to what we use for Botox. There also have been some studies of Chinese and Korean Botox, uh, botulinum toxin A, it's very similar to Botox, and again, they were, they're not available in the U.S., but they were very similar. So each toxin, 
So Botox has been the standard. It's been around longest. It's far and away got the largest market share for all uses. It's got a lot more indications. Um, Xeomin has an indication for blepharospasm and cervical dystonia. You know, Botox has an indication for, for um, axillary hyperhidrosis now has an indication for certain bladder issues. Um, I mean, there's a whole uh, upper limb spasticity, a whole host of things. Again, all the toxins are likely to work, but they've done the studies that prove that they work and the dosing, we know that what doses to use. Um, Botox often has less insurance issues because the insurance companies are used to it. When you start to write for other toxins or ask for another toxin, sometimes there can be pushback, even if it's going to cost them less because it's not in their protocol. So what will happen is I've asked for Xeomin and they say, uh, the patient has to fail Botox first. Wait, wait a minute, it's going to cost you half as much. Why are you arguing? Actually, it costs 60% less for, for this one indication. Um, and that's a problem with Botox, especially for those of you that use 25 or 30 or 35 units. The smallest vial is 100 units. So we have to often waste toxin. I hate it. You know, we have, when we use um, um, specialty pharmacies, a lot of insurance companies require us to get this from a specialty pharmacy. They give us one vial no matter how much we need, and I can only use that on that one patient. I can't split it or share it, even if I wanted to. So Botox may have a higher expense. Xeomin, which was approved several years back, three years ago, for blepharospasm, has a very similar dosing. The difference between Xeomin and Botox, they're both botulinum toxin A, but Xeomin has much less protein. It's kind of the naked, um, the naked toxin. Botox has, has a kind of a protein coat and that protein coat may lead to a higher likelihood of developing resistance or antibodies. They have a 50 unit vial. So if you're using 30 or 35 or 40 units, we can just use one vial and there's less wastage. Um, they have a very good patient support program, um, uh, especially financial support. And like every program, only good if you have commercial insurance. You know, the, the, the Medicare, Medicaid, Cal, Medicaid, and TRICARE are all government programs, and they don't allow any pharmaceutical company to provide you, to provide discounts to the drug or copay assistance programs because it's an inducement to use the product and therefore a kickback. So that's kind of why they, they're unable to, to give the same programs to those uh, patients on, on, on any, with any kind of federal funded insurance. Dysport is only approved in the U.S. for cervical dystonia and cosmetics. Not approved, hasn't been well studied. There's been some s small studies in blepharospasm. I'm sure it works. And maybe for some patients, they've tried both and they prefer one over the other and that's, that's fine. Um, it may last a little longer. There's a little more spread. So each toxin, again, depending on how, how it's diluted, how much you put in, and the toxin itself, some spread more than others. And I said before, there's no standard dosing conversion. So if you're on Botox and your doctor wants to put you on, on Dysport, it's a little difficult to decide how much is equally potent. Um, neurologists and ophthalmologists have a lot less experience with this drug in blepharospasm. So myoblock is the other toxin. It was the second toxin that came out. It's a pretty effective drug. It was always owned by a small company that never marketed it very well. And they've just never, <laughs> they've just never caught on well. Um, they're not indicated for blepharospasm, but in patients, especially patients who have ever think might have resistance to, to type A, then type B may be effective. Uh, myoblock's more painful. It just, the injections are more painful. Anybody here on myoblock? Nobody. Um, and it tends to cause more dryness of the mouth. And it's also shorter. So what do you do if botulinum toxin isn't helpful? So we were talking about that before. Um, first of all, 
kind of have to address what patient expectations are. What, what does it mean when your toxin isn't working? For some people, that may mean that they're not 100% cured. So you have to kind of sort out, are you better? Oh, yeah, I'm better, but it's not working. Um, so if it's not working, I think trying different dosing uh, uh, patterns or different dosing, increasing dosing usually, and you can increase the dosing sites. You can try a different toxin. You can try a different doctor. We're all different in the way we approach this. And again, I'll, I'll ask the audience, how many of you have, have, found, have been to more than one doctor and, and found that things were really different, that one doctor did a lot better than another? So it's a pretty common issue. Does it mean the first doctor is no good? No, just not, no good for you. Um, or maybe the pattern they use wasn't the best for you. But I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Things aren't going the way you want. I've seen plenty of patients who said they were on Botox and it didn't work. Or more commonly, I tried Botox, my eye closed, I couldn't open it. Or I'm never going to try that stuff again. And I have to do a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a song and dance and say, well, here's probably why it happened and here's how I do it. And I can't make any guarantees, but it's worth trying again. I mean, otherwise, you're going to suffer. Um, if none of the toxins really work, then certainly we're going to look at surgical options, and, and Dr. Kakawa will cover that in, in much more detail. So I said before that I, I think there's a very small role for adding oral medications. I spoke with one of you who came up and told me that, that, that they found the addition of Benadryl to be very helpful for them. Um, so it may be for certain people adding something I've read a lot about it. I used to use all the oral medicines years ago. It hasn't, it's not something that I can say, well, you should try X, Y, or Z, because none of them appear to be very effective. So, summarize my two talks. Oral medications are not very effective. Botulinum toxin is the most effective and widely used treatment. It's safe and tolerable for most patients. Multiple toxins are available, but only Botox and Xeomin are FDA approved. Thank you very much.